Thank you very much. I'd now like to ask uh, Presidents uh, Chu and Lai and Senior Associate Provost R to, to join us up here on the stage. We have uh, just about 15 minutes. And so I think rather than seizing the initiative here, what I would like to do is open it immediately for any any questions. If you don't have one, I'm going to ask one. Okay, I'll break the ice. Uh, this, this goes back a little bit, I think, to, to something President Lai said, and, and uh, talking about the sort of top-down versus bottom-up. And I, I want to ask you a little bit about the role of the president and the centralization versus decentralization of international efforts and international collaboration. For example, at Rice, we could contrast a couple different goals. One, one of our goals, which um, uh, I think a couple of you mentioned, was the internationalization of the student body. So for undergraduates, we set a goal of internationalizing our student body. And over about four years, it looks like we will have quadrupled the number, the percentage, actually, of foreign students in our undergraduate student body from under 3% to about 12%, probably, this coming fall. And that was, of course, a very centralized kind of decision made with, with consultation. In contrast, I would say, it have been research efforts where one ultimately relies on the individual efforts of uh, faculty members. Sometimes those are highly individualistic efforts, and sometimes those are efforts done by departments. And so I, I kind of wanted to ask each of your perspectives on how you see the role of the central administration, how you see the role of faculty, and, and how you see the role of intermediate organizations, such as departments and, and centers. How, how can we, as provosts and presidents, best encourage collaboration and yet not interfere with the collaborations? OK, so um, I think, um, first of all, as I said, the motivation of investigators to, co to, uh, to collaborate is really the key issue. So many people um, facing a lot of obstacles, as I mentioned in my talk, that uh, people tend not to collaborate because if they stay in our, our own uh, universities, then they can do research. But you want to step out and to do uh, collaboration internationally, then there are a lot of ob obstacles to, to overcome. So the, the role of the university, the top-down approach, is to minimize these obstacles. And the top-down approach is uh, for the two universities to sign an agreement to, and to focus on certain areas. Then the, and pull the interested faculty members and, or, and to say specific of which areas we want to collaborate, like uh, nano uh, technology or biotechnology or certain areas, stem cell research and, and so on. Then once these areas are identified, then the university can ask the interested faculty members to, to join. So I think this, the university play a very important role as a facilitator of um, collaboration. So then this essentially provides incentive, provides a, a push for the faculty members to, to collaborate. And the bottom-up approach, of course, will be most effective. That is, the faculty members have strong, certain faculty members have strong interest to collaborate already or to know, already know somebody in, uh, in a foreign country so they can collaborate. So, but uh, very few faculty members actually have this kind of contact. So if you want the university to do, to do well, uh, in international collaboration, then university certainly needs to play a facilitator role. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's very important. I think it's all this collabor collaboration starts out from the individual. If we don't get the, the faculty members involved, all this collaboration talks is basically is virtual. And um, as, as a result, uh, it's uh, restricted by several things. For example, you know, the size of the institutions. And just look at our, my university in Hong Kong has only about 500 faculty members. It's much smaller than the rest of the universities here. So we cannot do everything. We have to be more focused, look at certain areas. In terms of bottom up or top, uh, top, top down, I think bottom, both are needed. The top down approach is to create the, uh, or force, uh, create uh, a, an environment that will promote uh, collaboration in terms of finance, in terms of administrative structure and all that, the policy part. The bottom up is extremely important, but sometimes this can work against the collaboration, international collaboration. So therefore, we have to look at areas. They, have, uh, they are complementary, they have complementary strengths. And because everyone's uh, faculty members, we all know, and they are very competitive in order to be successful in their own fields. So there, there are two competing uh, factors involved. That is cooperation or collaboration versus competitions. This uh, collaboration will only take place when there exists complementary nature. Otherwise, it won't succeed. And I think uh, Professor Er mentioned some IP issue. It's a serious one. This is not just between university and university, and between, particularly in some sensitive area, becomes extremely important because we experience that when we work with some of the universities, and the university patent office would not yield as a result, even with the goodwill uh, from faculty members on both sides, we cannot proceed on that. So all in all, I try to see, uh, I try to say is that individual faculty members are the major uh, 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 factors that will determine the co collaboration will go forward or not moving forward. And the government's uh, the role and also university administration roles, I think we all know, is try to just bring down all the barriers uh, as, as much as we can, but in the, in the same time create policies which will enhance collaboration. <clears throat> I would just like to add to the, the part on the international student exchanges. Uh, NTU's um, approach is that uh, we adopt also a top-down and bottom-up approach. In fact, for our case, we have a target of uh, up to 50% of our students to spend one, term, either one semester or a, a short stint overseas. So it is a big target because we, we are a large university with about 21,000 undergraduates. So we're taking about 6,000 undergraduates a year. So 50% of that is, uh, is about 3,000. And basically what we have done is actually that we divide the 50% into 25% more on the more formal type, at least one semester, and the other 30% on a short stint type of overseas, maybe summer studies or uh, one to two weeks kind of exposure. And even that is a, is a tall order to, to get the number of places. So basically with a top-down top approach to set certain target, and we also need a bottom-up approach where we get the colleges and the school to also compete with each other because they also want to attract uh, they are answerable to their student as well. If they, they know that this student from another faculty is able to go and, and their own student cannot go, so there's a little bit of internal kind of competition as well. I like to bring up uh, some other obstacles. Uh, that we have to face in terms of international collaboration when it comes to uh, human research. I know some of you might have touched on this briefly, but I'd like to hear your comments on two uh, practical issues. One is the uh, informed consent issue. Currently, any U.S. investigator involved in international collaborative research has to make sure that the international collaborators meet the same U.S. requirements in terms of informed consent which entails a lot of details, which we probably won't have time to go over. But i still like to hear the panel's comments on that. The other practical issue is the transfer of uh, clinical materials, especially involving genetic materials. 
I know different countries have different policies. I understand Taiwan is a little bit more relaxed, but mainland China is very restrictive. Uh, so again, I don't know if there's any way we can influence the national policies such that uh, exchange of such materials could be facilitated, uh, especially when we study rare diseases where any one country may not have enough cases to launch a significant study. So I'd like to hear the uh, panel's comments on those two uh, practical issues. Maybe I'll start with uh, President Lai there since. In fact, I have personal experience in, in, in this area. For, for example, I direct a national genomic medicine programs in, in Taiwan. And uh, so in Taiwan, we have a collection of many DNA samples. But it's impossible uh, for, for us to ship this DNA samples to a foreign country. And so this is involves many sensitive issues. So I really don't have answer to you how to overcome this, this problem. So this is, has to be solved by, by the government at the government level. But this is certainly a ma major issue impeding uh, collaboration, science collaborations. Well, of course, our university has something to do with that. Indeed, the restrictions on the China side are quite strict. You know. But my personal uh, understanding is that uh, China, to a certain extent, many of the policies are following the US policy. If the US policies are very strict, they become even stricter. In terms of the uh, biological samples uh, exchange, is, that's to a certain extent it's, it's a result of that. And my understanding is whenever the US policy becomes relaxed, the Chinese policy becomes even more relaxed at a, at a certain time later. So I think that the issue is a real one. Particularly, one thing is if you look at China in terms of biodiversity, it's the greatest in the world. And they really consider that's a national treasury also. So in addition to the external factors, they also consider from their own interest point of view. If you go to the southwest China, you can find all kinds of species that you cannot find somewhere else. You know? uh, so um, they guard it very carefully. And uh, so I think as time goes on, it should improve. And I'm quite sure the US is also relaxing some of the rules, you know, at least in the T cell research, for example, you know, that kind of things. So I think uh, I'm, I personally is very optimistic in the future collaboration in terms of policy, you know, uh, re relaxation. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned in my presentation that um, currently uh, on the life science research, there is a policy on transfer of life tissue cultures and uh, certain highly infectious disease, disease um, the infectious uh, pathogens. Um, in fact, I have my colleagues from the ASTAR, uh, Dr. Lim, uh, Lim Kiang Wei, here in this audience. I wonder whether uh, Kiang Wei would like to elaborate further in this as, uh, aspect of, um, you know, in terms of policy matters. Yeah, so he, he, will, he will speak more about this tomorrow, yeah. David, could I add uh, another comment? Because recently I visited the Genome Center, and the part of the Genome Center in China moved to the southern part of uh, uh, China in Shenzhen area. And I think I look in their approach, somehow it's unique in the following sense. For example, in the genome study, they involve people from experts from different disciplines. I have not seen that. And in fact, they collaborate with some of the universities both inside China and outside China. They essentially looked into computer uh, 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 science, scientists and also physicists and biologists and mathematicians. And what I found out is recently, for example, they can uh, sequence the genome at a rate no countries in the world can compete at this moment. For example, that particular institution, they already identified 325 genes and they try to patent them. And they fo fo try to follow the Monsanto uh, 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 approach, you know, 
because in Monsanto, there are only a few genes they patent, and they made lots of profits. So the Chinese is, uh, at least this institute is trying to do that. But of course, we all know when you apply for a uh, patent, you have to describe the specific use, uh, usage of those genes. So that is a little drawback, so they uh, slow down. And I, what I, impress, uh, I was impressed is the following. They try to use the, um, uh, Charles, uh, use Darwin's approach, essentially try to find some patterns for the evolution of the world, you know, from the genetic point of view. Because uh, Darwin spent two years traveling and came up with this evolution theory, okay? And what they try to do is they, with all these uh, uh, genes discovered, and they hope they, they can accomplish that, in addition to the potential uh, commercial um, uh, benefits. So I would encourage everyone here, if possible, should pay some attention to the development of that area in China. I want to add one thing regarding the difficulty or reluctance of people to share biological materials. The, in, besides the issue of national policy, that actually uh, uh, the credit, how to share the credit, that's one of the major impediments to share the biological materials. Because if you send uh, DNA samples to uh, 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 investigators in a foreign country, then the investigator might get all the credits for, for discovering some things. So I think it's very important for people to talk to each other to make sure the credit are properly shared in, from the very beginning. I think this very often is a hidden agenda that's uh, impeding the, the sharing of the biological materials rather than the, the government policy. Great panel. Uh, I have a question. How do you guys measure uh, cross-border uh, collaboration? And more importantly, how do you reward and reinforce it within your institutions? <laughs> well, how to measure the success or failure of the cross-border collaborations? Well, this is very difficult. It's, it, it, of course, in terms of, of number, you can say that the, the, because, for instance, the government has certain country-to-country uh, uh, -country collaboration. So you can say that we have uh, collaboration with 10 different countries or 10 different universities. This is just one, one quali uh, quantitative measure. But whether that is really successful or not, and that's very difficult to say. But as I mentioned uh, in, in my talk, there is the uh, sabbatical um, professor spending uh, one year in University of Washington. Within one year, they have a very a great uh, paper uh, came, which came out after a year of uh, collaboration. And then the whole laboratory still, still stays in that, that uh, institution. So I think this is really a very successful program. But you are right, it's very difficult to, to put a specific quantitative or quality uh, parameters saying that, okay, you achieved this, you're successful. So probably we need to develop certain measures for, for measuring success of collaboration. This is probably should be a, a topic for discussion. Yeah, I, I would say it's a, it's, it's, a very good, uh, it's a very good question. I think the, in this day of uh, at least in the United States, with all the efforts of accreditation and things like that, our inclination to start measuring many more things uh, is probably a little bit limited. Uh, it's very easy to measure, for example, student participation, international exchanges, and things, things like that of various kinds. Um, I, I have to say, I'm not entirely sold on the importance of measuring individual to individual collaborations. I know at our university, I'm sure at every other, they're taking place in, in great numbers, and that doesn't really seem to be an obstacle. We want to know, I think, where there are, are obstacles. To me, the, the most important is developing structures that create permanence that survives the individual-to-individual -individual collaborations. 
And those one can count, at least at Rice, and probably a lot of these, uh, at least on probably two hands, if, if not, not on, on one. That is getting to the point that those individual collaborations have created strong department to department links, or one has created uh, new centers. I know one of my colleagues is going to be talking later about virtual centers. So for me, it's those sort of meta relationships, not at the university to university level where the presidents travel around the world. I have this expression that I use, plate relationships. I go somewhere and I give them a plate and they come here and they give me a plate and we have plate relationships. Uh, the, the trick is to move below the central administration and above the individual to individual, which I think, frankly, there are adequate incentives and possibilities. The, the hard thing, I think, is to reward, and we see that here, and incentivize individual faculty members, not who are just creating individual relationships, but are rather trying to move their departments and their centers and their colleagues beyond that individual relationship. One of the things that, that we did here was create a small travel fund for faculty aimed not at individual relationships, but rather at building institutional relationships. And I'll also say not limited solely to the institution-wide priorities, but allowing the faculty in some ways to find their own partners and own priorities. Uh, so I'm a little bit over here, but I think uh, we've, we've if you, as, as a percentage achievement, we have cut in half the time that we were late when we started. And so we'll uh, stop there. I want to thank our panelists, and we will move directly, I think, into the next part of our program. But please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to join uh, Ambassador Jerigian and President Lebron in welcoming you to this wonderful event. I want to thank the panel that we have just heard from, uh, distinguished uh, leaders with unique perspectives on this issue of international collaboration, and uh, very much appreciate your coming and uh, add my special thanks to uh, the participants, especially those who travel from such long distances. Um, I'm Neil Lane. I'm a senior fellow here and uh, a professor at Rice University. Uh, this issue of international cooperation science has been very important uh, to me from a policy perspective for a long time. So uh, I particularly uh, have enjoyed already the discussion this morning and look forward to what comes out of, the, uh, uh, of, our, of our workshop, which will follow. Uh, this morning we have two additional very distinguished uh, speakers who have considerable experience uh, with regard to international collaboration and who will share with us their unique perspectives. Uh, their bi biographies are included in the program and so I'll be very brief. Uh, I will introduce uh, each of them in turn and ask them to speak for uh, 20 minutes or less so that we have time for questions. So our first speaker is James Von Ayer II, who is the founder, chairman of Zyvex Performance Materials, Zyvex Instruments, Zyvex Labs, and Zyvex Asia. Mr. Von Ayer is recognized as uh, a leader within the nanotechnology industry. Uh, he founded Texas Nanotechnology Initiative and the Feynman Grand Prize in Nanotechnology. His significant gifts established the University of Texas of Dallas Nanotech Institute, the James Von Ayer Distinguished Chair of Science and Technology at the University of Texas Dallas, and the James Von Ayer Scholars Program at Michigan State University. And this morning he'll be sharing his experience as a businessman in nanotechnology with connections in Asia in his talk, which is titled Small but International the Zyvex Nano Empire. Uh, please welcome uh, Mr. Von Ayer. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, kind of amusing title, I think. Uh, 
maybe a bit pretentious, but we are a nano empire, a company of a uh, little over 50 people combined. So I, I'm going to give a different perspective. Uh, we don't do a, a lot of pure science collaborations. It's basically a business collaboration, science-oriented business. So I'm here primarily in the, uh, uh, to talk about Zyvex Labs and Zyvex Asia and what we're doing together. And as the old British Empire said, the sun never sets in the British Empire. Uh, I'm kind of amused and, and proud at the same time to say the sun never sets on the Zyvex Nano Empire either. So I started Zyvex in 1997 to develop molecular nanotechnology. I'll talk a little more about what I think that means. I've been involved uh, since before then. I, had a, I worked at Texas Instruments for a while, uh, started a very successful software company, which I t sold in 1995, which has allowed me to put more money into nanotechnology than any human on the planet. So either I am seeing something that a lot of people don't see, or I'm crazy, or probably a little of both. Uh, I won't go over and read all these things, but I have been very excited about the possibility of what nanotechnology can do, both from a, uh, a human development standpoint, how do we make the world a better place, and from a business standpoint, how do we make money making the world a better place. Over the years since we had Zyvex, uh, we have amassed uh, a lot of really recognizable and important customers. This is just a small section of some of the customers that we've had over the years. Uh, unlike a lot of nanotech companies, we're pretty pleased that we have products and, and such distinguished customers. I started this company in 97 as uh, basically a unified company. A couple of years ago, we spun it, broke it into pieces and spun off four independent companies. We had so many things going on, we couldn't really do it effectively in one company. So Zyvex Instruments, took our early nanoprober. We had built the first four probe, nanoprobe inside an electron microscope, and we used that to pull apart carbon nanotubes, measure their mechanical properties, and try to find out if they were really as good as they were reputed to be. And our early experiments uh, showed that they, they were. But there came a time, uh, a couple years after I started Zyvex, that just doing research didn't seem like that great of an idea. I was spending an awful lot of money doing research. And as a businessman, I said it's time to, to start commercializing some of this. So we actually commercialized this nanoprober as our first product. We had hired some nanotube researchers to work on how we can process nanotubes. And I had some thoughts about using those to build molecular machines to help us reach into the nano world and directly manipulate atoms and molecules. And we had a breakthrough in nanotube processing that led to Zyvex Performance Materials. We came up with a, a family, uh, actually a platform technology of processing and functionalizing nanotubes that led to Zyvex Performance Materials. When I spun those off, they seemed like great companies in the making, great technologies in the making, but my real passion is still atomically precise manufacturing. So we actually spun those off, hired managers for each of those pieces, uh, companies with customers and products. And I went back to the basics of Zyvex Labs. Uh, we are actually a five-person company right now working on atomically precise manufacturing. We are working with our um, sort of a, a brother company, Zyvex Asia, which I'm going to talk more about also. So just a brief overview of what these other companies do. Zyvex Instruments sells a nanoprober. Uh, here we see a picture of our eight probe system, landing eight very sharp little tungsten probes on an integrated circuit to probe the transistors of that circuit. We sell these primarily to the semiconductor industry worldwide. This is our flagship product, uh, about a million and a half dollar system. We buy a brand new electron microscope. We rip off the front door of it, put it in a box, replace it with our own front door, which has uh, up to eight, four, six, or eight probes, uh, in this case, eight uh, rack of equipment to drive those probes. And this is kind of what it looks like when you are sitting in front of the SEM. You see an image of an integrated circuit. This is a partially deprocessed IC. 
These little dots are about 100 nanometers. In this case, uh, the more advanced circuits, they're about 50 nanometers in diameter. We can land eight probes on a one micron dot inside this system. Uh, typically, what we do is probe the transistors for failure analysis. So we can land our probes on any transistor made in any chip in any fab of the world today. We get an IV curve out of that, shown on the right. Uh, the, the failure analysis engineers can use this to make uh, some design changes that save them a lot of money. And uh, a typical customer, uh, they don't like us to use their name for obvious re reasons, but one of our customers used our system for a week. They did a week of analysis. They went back and made a design change that saved them $20 million a year in one chip. Another customer had a similar experience. Uh, they said they saved $10 million a year in one chip. Now, I wish I could charge an appropriate price for this that uh, covers some fraction of what they save or, or make, but uh, the semiconductor guys are pretty tough customers. So I say, we, here we have the best product in the world, but a very tough set of customers right now. They don't like signing purchase orders. So it's a, it's a challenging business, but it's great to be in the position of having a product that solves problems. Cyvix so Performance Materials spun off we moved this company from, uh, and I, I might say uh, most of the companies, or the other two companies are based uh, just north of Dallas, Texas. Uh, Zyvex Performance Materials, we moved up to Ohio shortly after we spun it off because they have a lot of infrastructure up there for materials, advanced composites, and the like. So at Zyvex Performance Materials, we got early, uh, we got into the sporting goods business, uh, working with Easton Sports for their baseball bats, very popular baseball bats, bicycle parts. This particular bicycle is one that we presented to the president a couple of years ago. Uh, he was supposed to give it to the Smithsonian, but he liked it so much he paid the, in the income tax on it and kept it. Uh, we made a sailboat mast. It looks like we made the whole sailboat. I wish we did. Uh, that would use a lot more material than the bottom left product of the golf club shafts, which actually is our biggest customer right now. Uh, last year, Lockheed Martin invested, uh, bought 10% of the company. Uh, we also sold 10% of the company to our nanotube vendor, Arkema, a big French multinational company. So our business model with this company is we pioneer the products and then we spin off uh, or we, we outsource the manufacturing. So those are the, the operating companies and uh, I think we'll be spinning off more such companies in the future. But right now, I'm spending most of my time with Cybex Labs working on atomically precise manufacturing. The dream is to build something like this up here. The, uh, in this case, the blue atoms would be silicon. The green would be germanium. We build these things up an, an atom at a time using gas phase deposition and uh, scanning tunneling microscope etching. We then can release the part with an etch that uh, is preferential for the geranium. This is a vision of Zyvex Labs, sort of taking uh, the next step in manufacturing. Uh, I'd say year, you know, for most of human history, we had a hand crafting model. A uh, craftsman could make one of something, but if he wanted to make another one, it was basically go back and do the same thing you did the first time. Not much economy of scale. Ford realized there was a new way to do manufacturing. TI and Intel realized yet another new way of doing manufacturing. I think where we're going is a new, a new uh, revolution in manufacturing. I don't have time to get into that. That's not really the point here. But basically, our approach is to take some atomic precision tips. Working in an ultra-high vacuum scanning tunneling microscope, we can pop hydrogen off of a silicon surface. We can shower down a reactive molecule that sticks where we popped it off and repeat that process to build things in 3D. And uh, unlike about 12 years ago when I started Zyvex, uh, people didn't really want to talk to me. They thought I was pretty crazy. And I guess I was pretty far ahead of, uh, the, of the, the times. But now we have a DARPA program that's funding this exact program. We have all these partners working with us on it. Some er early results, uh, one of our partners is University of Illinois, Joe Lighting's lab. He did this very beautiful picture down here of showing the beginnings of atomically precise lithography. This is a silicon surface that has had the hydrogens popped off of it to make this little structure. 
we were about two atoms off in actually doing the structure that we wanted to make, so we still have some engineering to do, but it's pretty exciting to be able to do it. Now, what we're doing in Asia is working with Cyvex Labs in the U.S. to develop this atomic precision lithography to an engineering skill where we can do it repeatedly. So at the dawn, we are, we are at the dawn of the, uh, the global Zyvex nano empire. Uh, there were a couple of things that got me to look outside the country. There's a push and a pull. The push is that we've always been constrained by our ability of talent. And I don't have to belabor the point that our graduation rate in science and math and engineering is falling. And as a corporation, I see something that most of you don't, which is that when I target somebody who's really good and I want them to work for me, often they will pick a safer job in university or in a government lab. Coming to industry is viewed as, as a pretty risky thing to do. Uh, we can't import the talent because of the immigration barriers. I saw an interesting article recently, a reverse brain drain, that said not only now are we having trouble bringing people in, but the people who are here are increasingly going home to their home countries because they see more opportunity there and the governments are actively bringing them home, which is going to leave us in a pretty bad position in the U.S. Now, our particular approach to atomic precision manufacturing has uh, long been disparaged in the U.S. I don't quite understand why the idea of merging chemistry and engineering and software is such a controversial idea, but it is. And that means that our, our uh, Scientists often have problems with their peers, laughing at them. Uh, we have problems getting through peer review in things in the U.S. Uh, but we've noticed over the years that uh, Australia is doing a program very similar to this. Uh, Japan has long had programs to do atomically precise manufacturing. Just in recent few years, I would say the, uh, the U.S. government policy toward business in general and in investment has uh, turned negative. It looks like it's likely to get worse. So uh, it's not a very promising environment in which to spend a lot more money. And something that matters to me a lot is economic freedom. I, I see, uh, looking at the data, there is a strong correlation between the economic freedom of a country and how well they do in terms of their economic growth rate. Uh, we are falling, unfortunately, in that ranking. Uh, we were number three a few years ago, number five. Uh, we're now down to number eight with the most recent study that just came out uh, at the end of last year. Uh, the data is actually a couple years later than the study. And this measures things like uh, the size and uh, consumption of the government, uh, the economic investment uh, opportunities, taxation, regulation, a lot of things. Uh, it's called the Frazier Economic Freedom Ranking. And it's been mentioned earlier about the U.S. hostility to foreign visitors. I have an anecdote there from one of my engineers in, uh, in Singapore. He came into the country at the end of 2007, came back, uh, having been here for several months of training. He came back in. He was stopped, uh, flew through Minneapolis. He was stopped, pulled aside by the customs agents, put in a small room. Two of them ganged up on him, were in his face telling him he was a liar, he was coming here to work illegally, they knew it, they were on to him, they weren't born yesterday. Uh, they made him give up his passwords, all of his email passwords. Uh, pretty intimidating for a, a fresh kid right out of school. He called me up, he was rattled, and uh, there's not much we can do about it, unfortunately. We just, fortunately he did uh, get out, they allowed him to, to catch his plane to Texas. He had a visa, of course, that allowed him to come into the country for his training. But it was just embarrassing to have to apologize to him. You've all experienced, I'm sure, conference attendees. Uh, we had another experience similar to that. A vice president of Jilin University was invited to a conference at UT Dallas. He couldn't get a visa in time to make the conference. Very embarrassing. So that's kind of pushing me to look to a, a friendlier regime. The pull side is that 50% of our sales for Zyvex instruments are in Asia. Um, clearly, Asia has the opportunity to be a major force in the 21st century economy. Forward-looking companies really ought to be there. Now, I'm not saying it's a slam dunk. Uh, their governments have to be intelligent to take advantage of this opportunity. 
I see some countries in the world are still quite friendly toward business and wealth creation. A few of them are immigrant and trade friendly on top of that. Uh, our business development manager in Singapore took about six weeks to get a visa to, uh, to work there. I couldn't get her a visa, even with a PhD in physics, couldn't get her a visa in the US in less than several years, probably. And I, I see that Singapore is, is really pulling out the stops to recruit talent, capital companies, and, and some of these big ideas. So the reasons that I decided to go international, uh, access to talent is really the primary reason. But I, I wanted a local presence in market regions where we have a big presence already. And as an investor, I'm looking for an investment-friendly place where I can put in money, put it to work, grow things for a 20-year kind of time horizon. So when I started looking at the right places, I, I looked around. Uh, Singapore had been recruiting me for years. Hong Kong is my favorite city on the planet. I went there and looked and uh, found a lot to like about that. China, of course, we, we all know the cost of labor, the ability of, of people to hire talent. We also talked with Taiwan, Korea, Japan, been invited to those places to see what's going on. Others, uh, Russia has a lot of nanotech going these days, uh, some of the European countries. But for me, uh, I'm gonna talk about in the next slide what, what the factors were. Uh, I like to say it's important to get the best deal before you sign up. Um, during the honeymoon, or during the courtship, I guess, is always the best time to, to get a good deal and then once they're work, try to work with the best people. So the quality of the institutions which really matters to me. I want a government that's good and clean, uh, believes in the rule of law, property rights, socially tolerant, uh, great universities, good ethical collaborators, people who won't steal our ideas, and uh, places where you can get good graduates. Need a place that's connected, receptive to foreigners. Financial incentives are always nice, but they're not really decisive. Any company that would go someplace for financial incentives is thinking very short term, because these things burn out before you really get established. Same thing with cheap labor. I wouldn't go to some place because I had cheap labor. I've seen companies do that. Uh, the labor gets more expensive over time. If you go to a place that's growing, uh, it's going to get more expensive. Uh, there's turnover and productivity issues that make it very, very challenging. And. Uh, a lot of these places that have cheap labor don't have the management talent to effectively utilize it, so it's not so cheap at the end of the day. So I, I picked Singapore. They've got two top 100 universities uh, in these top 100 rankings. Consistent ranking is number two in the world for economic freedom, right behind Hong Kong. Consistent ranking is either number one or number two in undergraduate uh, education. A technocratic government that is very understanding of the benefits technology brings to their country, focused on commercializing new things, uh, including nanotechnology. Worldwide recruitment of talent, you probably all know somebody who has been poached by Singapore or recruited, as you're, depending on your point of view. Uh, they got a lot of programs that help defray the cost of coming and very business friendly place. Uh, you probably can't read any of this slide, but this is showing some of the, the programs that they have for companies, for investors, uh, for universities, for collaborators. They have a lot going on. Uh, they're putting serious money into recruiting people to come there and set up shop. And as I say, that's not the only factor, but it certainly tells me that this is a country that's going to be friendly to investment and innovation, and that's the place that I want to be. We actually were able to, to use one of these programs to pay for training our first couple people. So we started by hiring an expert on Asian nanotechnology, uh, Lerwin Liu, who has a, a, a company called Nanoglobe. Uh, she introduced me to a lot of people, actually several of you in this room. Uh, we picked, Hong, uh, picked Singapore, Hong Kong was a, was a very close second, but uh, incorporated. We used this EDB uh, STRAT program to train our first couple of employees we are currently in a cooperative R&D program with uh, Emory, and uh, I guess that Dr. Lim is going to put a slide up uh, showing his perspective of it. Uh, my perspective is that we have a lab in Emory, office space, co-investment in hardware, and uh, some staff that's very good helping us do our program. 
Uh, in return for that, uh, I gave up some sh shared IP. Uh, we are sharing this IP that we're developing, uh, joint spending commitments. I'm putting quite a bit of money into this with some ambitious plans for how we get to where we're going. We are in the process of bringing up our ultra-high vacuum scanning tunneling microscope. I just got back in town yesterday morning from uh, about a week and a half there. And that allows us to actually have, in our little nano empire, we have 24 hour a day now uh, use of, of a scanning tunneling microscope somewhere. When we get a system, when we get a sample in Texas, we can have them drive our system over the internet while we sleep and vice versa. So I expect from this we're going to have some spin-offs and I'm personally going to be making more investment in other Singapore companies, working with some incubators and uh, PC funds over there as well. Now, my lessons, though, is that uh, it had higher costs, lower progress than I planned. Uh, I didn't realize. I always thought that, uh, you know, Asian countries were all very hardworking, uh, very diligent companies, but there are a lot of vacations going on over there. It seems like China's always having vacations. Uh, Singapore has multiple religious groups. Each one of them gets their holidays, and the whole country takes a holiday for every religious holiday that there is. So you look at the calendar, and there, there are a lot of them. Uh, of course, fast economic growth means fast salary inflation. Uh, we don't have as much infrastructure. I can't go down the street to a Fry's and pick up some electronics. Uh, basically, I go to the Fry's in Richardson or in Plano, Texas, and pay $100 to ship it to Singapore whenever we need some parts. Uh, I found, uh, to my surprise, a safety bureaucracy in Singapore, which I uh, don't think of that place is having much of bureaucracy, but safety bureaucracy is the most insidious one there is. There's no way I can argue against the safety bureaucrats. I mean, we all want safety, but it, it does cost a lot of money. It slows things down uh, as they're learning what's, uh, what's truly safe and what is uh, bureaucrat safe. But the pleasant surprise is lower cost than I anticipated, lower friction in, in a lot of areas, depreciation. I don't know how many different depreciation time frames there are in the U.S., but in Singapore, there are two, uh, one-year equipment and three-year equipment. It's simple. It's so simple, I couldn't believe it. Taxation, simple, clear, predictable, and reasonable. Wow, you know, we don't need to hire um, tens of thousands of dollars worth of accounting every quarter to file my tax. Uh, the government is very authoritarian there, as a liberty-loving person, sometimes I chafe a little bit, but it's not capricious. It's just, uh, this is the way you do things. So understanding the rules going in, uh, I can deal with it. We're already starting to see some of the advantages of this close cooperation. Um, we have some very skilled and talented people that we're working with. And uh, since setting up shop there, uh, I certainly didn't forecast the deterioration of the business climate here in the U.S. It has taken a big whack out of my net worth, which has slowed down what we're doing. But uh, you know, it's great to have the opportunity to be there. So I better stop. I uh, see it's time. So thanks for your attention, and hope to talk to you all at the, later in the conference. Yeah, maybe. We do have time for a question or two, though, if uh, Mr. Van Eyre would be willing to take a couple. Sorry, I didn't mean to chase you off. Other questions? Let me just ask whether U.S. export controls affect you at, at all, if that's a problem. Um, export controls do not affect our equipment business. They do severely affect our materials business. Uh, we we uh, believe that we are covered under the commerce control list, which is the less restrictive regime for our nanotube materials. Boeing, when we were working with them, said, no, we're covered under ITAR. <laughs> Uh, we had a program with DARPA. We ended up spending more money hiring consultants to advise us on ITAR than we made from the DARPA contract. So it actually was a net negative for me to even be doing this work. Um, in, in respect to the atomic precision manufacturing, uh, DARPA is funding one third of that. The state of Texas is funding a third, and I'm funding a third personally. Uh, it's pre-competitive, so DARPA doesn't have a problem with us working with Singapore. And Singapore is a, it's a pretty DARPA-neutral country, DARPA, in fact, DARPA-friendly country, I guess, that DARPA has good relationships. So that hasn't been a problem for us here. Any other questions?
Thank you very much, Mr. Von Ayer. I appreciate the, you raising the issue of uh, some barriers that involve U.S. policy at the borders. I think uh, all of those instances are embarrassing, and some of them are tragic. Some of them have to do with just uh, incompetence, and people ought to be fired. Not much we can do about that. Others have to do with larger government policy principle. In a democracy, we can do something about that. I'm hopeful that, uh, that, that we will be able to make progress in that area over the coming years. This country needs to be friendly, uh, a friendly place, a welcoming place to people from all over the world. And I think uh, that, that image has suffered a little bit. Uh, we all want to move uh, in a more progressive direction, I think. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Von Ayer. very much appreciate you being with us and your wonderful perspective. Our second uh, speaker of this morning's session is uh, Dr. Andy Yao, who's a professor of computer science and a director of the Institute of Theoretical Computer Science at Tsinghua University. Professor Yao has an interesting and, a, and an extraordinary uh, career trajectory uh, in that he attended the National Taiwan University for his bachelor's degree, Harvard University and University of Illinois for PhDs in physics and computer science, respectively. Uh, I don't think he went to med school, but, but uh, that may still be on the horizon. And then he returned to Asia to work at, at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, this has allowed him to see science in three different regions, the three different regions which we are highlighting in this workshop. Uh, he is a member of the U.S. Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and has received many honors, including the prestigious Turing Award. His talk this morning is titled, Nurturing Scientific Talents in China and the USA, Common Goals and Opportunities. Please welcome Mr. Dr. Yao. Thank you, Professor Lane, <clears throat> for the nice introduction. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Andy Yao. I'm really pleased to have a chance to speak with you here today. And I would like to thank Professor Neil Lane and also Professor Chris Palam for inviting me. I was born in Shanghai, China. At the age of 21, I came to the United States for graduate study, and I stayed here for more than 30 years uh, as working in academia, as professor in, at MIT, Stanford, and Princeton. In 2004, I decided to leave Princeton University and uh, return to China to take on a professorship at Tsinghua University. China, at that time, had started an ambitious program trying to, to build up a few first-rate leading research universities in the world within a few decades. And I was enormously attracted and excited about that endeavor. And uh, so I decided to, that I had something to contribute and went there. Now, uh, it's been five years. And I have to say that the past five years have been one of the most uh, the interesting and exciting period in my life. And uh, so today, in this talk, the first part, I would like to tell you a little bit about my experience in China. And uh, uh, as you will see, the uh, building up a research team and an education program involved quite a bit, and actually I would say the dominant part being international collaboration. And uh, now after that, 
in the second part of the talk, I would like to draw from my experience there some uh, inference which may be surprising to, uh, to people and actually surprising to myself uh, five years ago. Now here's uh, Tsinghua University, and you can see it's a lovely campus. I think that uh, 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 certainly, if uh, I'm only showing you the classical part, and and uh, well, there's a more modern part which would feature all the big buildings donated by uh, business people for business and information technology and law school and so on. And so five years ago, I came to that lovely campus on Tsinghua University. And uh, so my goal uh, initially was quite limited. I was, I was uh, only planning to do a small part by building up a research program in my own specialty, namely theoretical computer science. And uh, I think that probably most of you may not know what theoretical computer science is, but it's, uh, you can regard its relation to computer science in the same relationship as theoretical physics to physics. Except that theoretical computer science uh, has a fairly close relation with practice. And so many of my friends have become very rich uh, in the process. And now, uh, however, after I went there, I discovered that uh, I had to do something more. Just taking on a couple of graduate students the same way as I did in the United States is not going to work because uh, their undergraduate curriculum was lacking in many of the things. And so I decided that I have to do something about the undergraduate education uh, too. And so pretty soon I discovered that I had to do a lot of things. I had to, to start out from the undergraduate curriculum to the graduate curriculum to the postdoctoral curriculum and uh, uh, to try to really to manage all this. And uh, uh, so two years ago, I decided I would start an independent institute within Tsinghua University. So it's independent in the sense that it's not part of the computer science department, but it's sort of directly reported to the uh, uh, university leadership. And uh, over the last five years, especially the first couple, I had to think about questions like this almost every day. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, as you can see, that the, the problem that, that I faced was uh, pretty, pretty daunting. I went there without a team, I just a single person. I, I went there. And uh, the area of theoretical computer science was totally absent in China. So uh, there was essentially no uh, theoretical computer science in China. And, and uh, uh, now, in, the, in this environment, how could I produce an environment that would nurture young talents, young students? and also create a research environment for more mature scientists in my, in my, in my area. And, and so I have to ponder such question, uh, what should universities do to turn out innovative minds? What should students do to become creative and innovative? And what could I learn from the uh, lessons in, uh, in foreign institutions? And uh, so I, I really, it, it's, uh, I, I couldn't think of any good way of doing it in the beginning, but finally I had my eureka moment, and 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 that, that would solve all my problem. And uh, actually, it's pretty. It's, the the principle is pretty simple, namely that uh, initially I was only thinking about how I would do it in the United States. If if I if I were given a lot of resources, how should I start to build up such a thing in a vacuum? And uh, uh, basically, you would just try to, to create, try to recruit the best minds you can, and so on. And if you happen to be in a good university, that makes the job slightly easier. And, and uh, however, it really wouldn't work in, 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 in China. So uh, I had to go to try to forget everything I learned in the United States. I have to think that, that uh, if you think about China, what are the special weaknesses 
and the special strength. And uh, now you have to try to maximize the strengths, to use them in a way so that you would succeed despite all the weaknesses. And the weaknesses are pretty daunting. And, and, uh, and normally, you wouldn't think that, that it, it could be done, because you simply couldn't really get any established people to come in a, in a even no, much how, no matter how much money you pay them. So now, what are the China's advantages? Well, firstly, China has the raw material, the intellectual material, for, uh, for success, namely that it has a, a fairly, fairly good college, uh, high secondary school education. So the students, especially in the place that I work, Tsinghua University, they are really the top of the whole country. And so I have excellent students to work with. And secondly, we have a very large number of overseas Chinese who are very successful in many fields, including in my, in my own field. So if I can find some way so that uh, to put them together, then uh, that would, I think that perhaps uh, just taking the law of chemistry, then, then you, you, you cannot fail. However, the, 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 the difficulty is that uh, how can you get them together in a very close way? And uh, now, that's a, a advantage. And, and now, how can you actually make it work? Well, China has some additional advantages. It has a very rapid economic growth uh, for the last, I don't know, 30 years. And uh, now, one of the difficulties that one have to do uh, in order to do, it, to do innovation is that you have to do it in a way that do not harm the existing groups. And now, with a very econo rapid economic growth, it's possible for China to just put extra money into new areas, and it doesn't really hurt anybody. So there wouldn't be that much, much resistance. And now another one is that, that, that China has a fairly good way to, to do pragmatic problem solving. And there are, I have found that in China, that if you can convince the key people some ideas that, that they find exciting, and think doable, then they can cut the red tapes, and they can do things in a hurry. And that would be, so there are things that you can do in China that would be very, very difficult to do in the United States or in other places, or in Hong Kong or in, in Singapore. And uh, uh, so I have to take the advantages, and I have to think how to weave them together. So, the, so that's the big question. I have to, uh, I have to, I have to come up with, and now the, the eureka moment that that I mentioned is that when I realized that uh, all the difficulties that I found almost impossible to to solve is because that I have asked the wrong question, and uh, uh, the the fact is that it it sometimes if you try to solve a harder problem, actually it might be easier. And uh, so after a couple of years, I have came up to the conclusion that the only way so that I can make a reasonably successful program is actually to have a super high aim. Namely, what I want to do after a couple of years is that, that I want to build a super highway for computer science education and research program in China, so that they are competitive with any of the best universities in the United States. And that this way, we can offer a rational career choice for the best Chinese students, so that, firstly, the, but the most brilliant Chinese undergraduate students, they could stay, they could choose to stay to receive graduate education in China. And secondly, if your aim is very high to create the best in the world, then it becomes possible to think about retracting overseas Chinese 
and actually even non-Chinese to come and work for us. And uh, so that, is, that was the vision that I decided to do. And I talked to the university leaders, and uh, uh, they were very supportive about it. And, and so they had tried very hard, both within the university and to the government, to secure uh, the resources for me. And essentially, uh, I had a very pleasant situation uh, at that time. Uh, st starting at that time, namely that, 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 that I have returned the problem into solving an easier problem. And, and uh, I think put it more colorfully is that if you have a chance to have an infinite resource, how would you use them in order to, to, to build the best program in the world? And so uh, that was my mission in the last few years. And uh, so the, the, one of the first thing I decided to do was to uh, create an undergraduate honors program. And uh, you know that the, in, in China, they have a national exam system, uh, as is in many parts of, uh, uh, of, of Asia. And this national exam system would take, I think that every year there, there's probably uh, a million uh, uh, high school students uh, took this exam, and uh, uh, so they would be ranked according to their score, and uh, they would get selected by universities according to, to their scores. And uh, well, this way, Tsinghua is, uh, I think it's something like 70 or 80 percent of the best student, engineering student, and science students, they would choose Tsinghua University as, as, as their first choice. So at Tsinghua, we really have a, a, a concentration of talented students that I think that, uh, uh, roughly speaking, it would be like that you put Caltech, MIT, and uh, uh, Stanford all together in one place in terms of the quality of the students. And, and uh, so, we take in about 160 uh, computer science major every year in Tsinghua, and out of which uh, I, I would select a class, again by exam, a class of 30 students in my, in my program. And the, uh, the basic core of the program is that I would design 10 special core courses in theory and in computer systems for these students so that uh, they, would, they would have a training in depth and scope to be comparable to what we have in Princeton or Stanford. And uh, I also started a graduate program in theoretical computer science. And I think the basic core is the philosophy is that it's, it's emphasizing international collaboration. And so basically, my thinking uh, is that if you play chess with the masters, then after a few years, you will become a near master yourself. So only by having a program that is totally communicating with the international, uh, 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 international community in theoretical computer science, uh, if you do it consistently, then uh, when you interact with only the best, then uh, eventually you will turn out to be the best. So now, exactly how do I carry out the international collaboration? And uh, well, firstly, you have to provide an environment for students and for carrying out research. So we have a very strong postdoc group. And uh, now, this group of, of postdocs I recruited from the international market at the Western uh, salary standard. And, and uh, uh, right now, I have six postdocs in our center. And uh, uh, in a few months, there will be 10. And I think that would be the biggest uh, group of postdocs anywhere in theoretical computer science in the world. And also, uh, I have recruited uh, a team of senior professors. 
and uh, they would constitute something which is called a chair professor team. This is a, a, a new construct in Tsinghua University. Tsinghua started a program called chair professor teams concept so that, uh, that, that nominally it is one position. And uh, uh, now this position is endowed with a uh, funding and salary that is competitive with the Western uh, uh, standard. And however, the person holding the chair doesn't need to do all the job by himself. The, the chair, the leader, can recruit uh, a number of professors who add up all together would spend 10 months in Tsinghua University to uh, interact with the students and direct students. And, and so uh, we have recruited a really uh, a, 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 a 20 prominent researchers who promised to, uh, to help me in, in, in making our theoretical computer science program work. And lately, in, in uh, just about, about a year and a half ago, I decided that we probably should, even, should start even earlier than, uh, than, the, uh, than the graduate program in terms of getting people into our program. So uh, we have started recruiting from freshmen uh, in computer science to enter our graduate program in the sense that, that uh, there's a reasonable chance for them to want to stay in our program in the future. Of course, it's not a, it's not a, a, a binding commitment on their part. So for this group of students, we would spend particular effort. We would uh, nurture them, uh, not just in terms of the technical knowledge, but also we would take them abroad. We promised that we would take them at least once a year. So for example, we have taken the current, uh, the, the first class of this special pre-graduate class. We took them last year to Australia to visit four universities and uh, just a couple of months ago, we uh, uh, took them to Japan to visit four, four universities. So we would like to, to train them, not just as technicians, but also in terms of their their horizon and their temperament as scientists as well. So we would ask them to read biographies of great scientists. And uh, so we, we would, in, in other words, we would try to train them to be stars in our, in our profession. Now, uh, here's our, uh, just to show you the, how international uh, we, we got. And, and, and actually, we, uh, you, you probably, you can see that we have people from Many different from the, we have French, uh, from the Netherlands, from Israel and India and uh, uh, Macedonia and, and 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 so on. And now uh, we will have uh, some new postdoc. As I, as I mentioned, we have some very strong new postdoc coming. And now, uh, in the last few years, as I mentioned, that uh, our area it used to be a desert in China. Uh, it's it, and. Uh, uh, if you look at what we have accomplished, probably you can just uh, focus on the right, the right hand column. Uh, that's the top tier conference and journals in our conference in our, in, in, in our field. And as you can see, starting from 2004, we have a very small number. And uh, actually, those numbers were mainly contributed by myself and, 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 uh, uh, and collaborators. But uh, as you can see, in the, starting from the last, the, the last two years, uh, there are, our students published uh, almost all the papers were due to our students in collaboration with visiting professors and, and chair professor uh, team members. So uh, these conferences, before we came, actually there were no mainlanders. People, academics in mainlanders have never been successful. In, in breaking into these conferences. And now we, we really publish them routinely. And uh, uh, we even got some best papers in some of the best conferences in the United States and in Europe. And now, uh, so far we have graduated 10 PhDs and uh, uh, three of them went to North America in the US and Canada to do postdoctoring and one, uh, went to, to Hong Kong to become a professor 
and one stayed in Tsinghua as a professor, and uh, uh, the other five went to industries in, uh, and, and research labs in China. And I think that one thing that I'm not happy about is that none of the people who decided to stay in China went to become professors in any universities in China. Uh, I, I think that presumably the salary gap, it's, uh, it's still a really big problem for, for uh, the universities in China. And, and also we have started some very high profile symposium and uh, let me just tell you uh, one of these symposium because it's pretty special. This we call the China Theory Week. And every year we now uh, have a conference called China Theory Week that would invite uh, 25 or so top senior graduate students in our field to, to come to participate. And we would pay all the uh, expenses for them to come. And, and uh, so that's a really uh, broke new ground because there were a lot of conferences uh, in the world right now, but all of them would involve uh, mature scientists. And uh, uh, so we decided that because in our field, really uh, uh, the young people made most of the big discoveries. And so there are many graduate students, even in their graduate day, in their student days, would uh, make very significant breakthroughs in our area. And we would like to, so we, do, so we did this for, for three things. Firstly, it is something that is worthy to do, uh, but uh, nobody did it. And uh, secondly, we, we would like to create a, to make a contribution to the international community so that uh, we would have the young people would uh, get more acquainted with each other and to have a chance to collaborate. And thirdly, uh, and that's a selfish reason, I would like the, the, these young students to have a chance to get to know our institute while they were still students. And, and so, uh, they, so, so that in the future, uh, they could possibly want to come to our place to be a postdoc. And also, we would like to to uh, uh, get acquainted with them when they were young so that in five or 10 years, when they become the major force in the field, then we would already have a very close connection with them. And, and, and as you can see, this is just our chair professor team. Really, uh, these are uh, uh, the, the top of, uh, all of them are really uh, very well-known people in our field. And, and so, okay, let me do it again. Well, just, <laughs> uh, we, I spend a lot of time creating these graphics, so I, I really want you to see them. And also, it's very fitting, because now you see how international we are. In, in terms of international collaboration. These are really f uh, people. I think most of them are either in Israel or in the United States, but they really, they really uh, came from very uh, diverse origins in the world. And now, going forward, what do we plan to do? Well, we all, I think that it's, uh, it's a pretty, uh, impressive that in a short year we have uh, become a very well-known center in our field. And, uh, and, and I would also mention that, uh, that, that one of our graduate students uh, during this, his graduate student days has solved a very well-known open, long-standing open problem in the field. And uh, uh, now, so going forward, what we would like to do is to forge more collaborations on an institution-to-institution -institution basis. And uh, for example, the Aarhus University in Denmark, we uh, have started a, a very strong collaboration program, and we are uh, trying to get a, a funding from the uh, uh, National Science Foundation in both countries to uh, fund our collaboration. And uh, after 
the, my stay in this workshop here, I'm going to MIT later this week, and we are having a very uh, serious collaboration initiative uh, between the uh, uh, computer science lab at MIT and us about, about uh, an uh, international program. And uh, this is within an initiative, I think some of you may know, that MIT has started uh, studying a possible uh, initiative in Asia, and it consists of a China strategy and also an India strategy. So uh, I'm going to MIT uh, later this week. It's uh, within the framework of the China strategy of, of them. And we also have a very strong tie with the University of Pennsylvania and, and uh, uh, within the framework of Tsinghua and the UPenn. Uh, in, and, and now, the other thing that, that, that we are trying to do in our institute is that to, to publish a new series, computer science uh, book series, in, with Chinese publisher. And I think that up to now, there really is no strong book publication uh, in our field. And I would like to start a first-rate publication that would be very useful to all the world. And OK, so now I come to a second part, which is uh, not going to be uh, very long. And so I would like to, to, uh, uh, to uh, infer from my experience in China about co collaboration and to uh, say a few things uh, to make some broader comments on US-China collaboration. Uh, in the past, for the last 20 years, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, collaboration effort between U.S. and China really is quite asymmetric. And uh, that actually is a, uh, there's a good reason for that. If you look at United States, it already has an efficient higher education research system that function, that's function, functionally almost perfectly. It's the envy of the world. And all you need to do is to continue attracting talents from the world to feed this machine so that uh, it's going to, to generate outcome. And China ha is an entirely different situation. China, even now, is only just starting to develop such an efficient system and hope to do it within a short time. And now, the priority in China is to try to attract overseas Chinese to return to China to make contributions. And, uh, and uh, so the two countries have very different, at very different stages. And so the collaboration is really quite asymmetric. And uh, now if you look at it, what it means is that uh, the common US-China collaboration mode in science is that well, the Chinese students would go to the States and doing graduate study there, and there's a moderate number of U.S. professors that would pay in short-term visits to China to help the research and their education there. And there are, there are some strong uh, special cases, individual joint projects, but there are fewer institution-to-institution -institution deep collaborations. And uh, this is certainly true in the past. I think. Uh, uh, it, 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 even now, this is the general perception. What about the future? Well, I think that, that if you look at what we have done and the, uh, uh, the quality of international collaborations that we have. So let me just put in a, a little story here. Uh, Aarhus University had a very strong group in theory of computer science, and they visited us last year. And, and uh, we, we actually uh, held a workshop a few months ago in Beijing. And uh, now we had a very lively open problem session. And now, now, just after a month or so, one of our researchers solved one of their open problems. And so uh, it really means that the collaboration quality is very high, even at at, uh, at this point in our institute. So, uh, my, so the, the, the lesson that I draw from my experience is that what happened in our institute is just an accel accelerated version 
of what would be in China in many, many places. And so I would say that, that the, in the future, the relation between US-China collaborations would be much more symmetrical. And uh, 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 it will become the norm. I think that even now, there are some places have, have uh, symmetric collaboration in areas. I think that, uh, 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 but it will become the norm uh, within a not too distant future. And now, so the, 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 the driving force for this change is that the first, firstly, I think there's a recognition that the United States students, they need to know Asia better simply because of the economic development in Asia. And secondly, the, the universities in China will achieve excellence in many scientific fields. And uh, I think that China is, has started to a very energetic program to experiment on many different models, trying to bridge the gap between the past and the future in a hurry. So the experience that I have is just one of the models that they are trying. And there are, I, I know several other places personally that they are using a different approach, but they all try to bridge the gap in a, in a hurry. So in the future, uh, the relation of collaboration will more like the US and Europe, and, and Europe collaborations. And uh, 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 one thing that I would like to think of as the ultimate test of when a, a good collaboration has been achieved. Namely that I would like to see the days when students in science from the United States would go to China to take up full-time graduate studies and, the, and get a degree there. And I think it's, it, it is going to, to happen. And I have some inkling that is going to happen in our field in the, in the not too distant future. I already have started receiving applications from India and from, from, and from uh, Singapore and, and uh, to try to get into our graduate school. But I hope that they will come when we also get to see US students. And just to conclude my, my talk uh, uh, about my, my experience in China and about U.S. Collaboration, uh, China collaboration, uh, I think that the first rate research university in China may happen sooner than most people believe. I think that, that uh, before I went to China, many friends uh, uh, told me that it was a losing effort. It just could not be done. But after five years in China, I believe I'm much more, I'm even more optimistic than before I, I went there. And uh, uh, the second point, observation I have, is that uh, there is just an overwhelming enthusiasm from, from my, my scientist friend all over the world to, uh, to help me in this project. They think that it will be much healthier it would be really great to have very strong research centers in places outside of, of uh, Europe and the uh, United States. And I believe that, that, that the way things are going uh, in the not too distant future, I believe that, that China will really have research centers that are comparable to the best research centers in the United States. And uh, now, uh, one thing that I have often been asked is that, is Chinese culture a handicap, an obstacle to scientific progress and to uh, international collaboration? And uh, uh, I believe this is, is not the case. I believe that the culture issue is a, an overemphasized point. I really believe that there are only good scientists and, uh, and bad scientists. And I, I think the culture, I think that, that all you need to do for young people is to show them some model on what great scientists should be. And they, they will just, just, just emulate. And, and uh, 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 so I, I think uh, the, the, the cultural problem, one can just ignore it. And uh, the last point I want to make is that I think the US-China collaboration uh, is a win-win situation. I think we are competing for talents right now, but we have to think that in the future, 
the pool of talent is going to be limitless. I think the, 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 the progress in China and India means that in the future, we are going to have a wealth of talents unimaginable right now. And I think there will be enough talents left over for everyone. And China certainly will not need all the talents that it can produce. Thank you very much. So other questions? So when you look at the system, the ecosystem of, of, of a scientific innovation, there are many components of it. And one of it is the funding environment. And I often talk to my colleagues in Europe and we are comparing the, fu the funding system here with multiple agencies and, and uh, especially NSF with being you know, science driven and some mission oriented agencies. And, and many people agree that, that, that this is a strength of the United States in compar comparison, for example, to the European system, which tend to be very, very bureaucratic. And I'm wondering what, what is the funding environment that you have in, in China, or where is, it, where is it evolving to? And how do you see it play a role in promoting science in China? Uh, well, thank you for the question. I think that the, the question is about the, uh, the funding practices in China. Uh, China Actually, the funding practice, uh, I think as Professor Paul Chu mentioned, that China pays close attention to what the United States does. And uh, so its, it's funding, uh, in many cases, is very similar to what the U.S. has. So, for example, China has a Natural Science Foundation, which is entirely patterned after the National Science Foundation here. And so they would have peer review and, 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 and uh, 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 just supporting basic sciences. Uh, but they also have some national project. And again, as, as Professor Chu mentioned, the 973 project, which is a, uh, a, 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 a initiative to fund, they, they would call fundamental science project, but, but it's, it's, it's much more applied than, uh, than, than, than implied by the words. And uh, so that's, uh, I think that the review is, it's, it's, uh, uh, I think it has a particular system for doing it, not as, as like the peer review system as the Natural Science Foundation, but uh, 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 they, I think they would all more like the, the DARPA and, and the uh, U.S. Uh, systems. And uh, now, these are the regular things, and, and uh, uh, they are very precious. And uh, uh, now in China, getting funding not only means money, but it also means prestige for your, for your promotion and, and so on, much more than here. But maybe I'm wrong. It's, it, it's also very important here. And, but China has something in addition, namely that, that, that uh, China is very eager to attract uh, senior scientists to help them, to lead them in uh, uh, elevating their research efforts. And so I think that if you are from a a uh, first-rate university and you are very famous in your field, then in China there are avenues where you can get funding even outside of, 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 of these avenues. And personally, I have had... You like this model. So, so personally, I have, I have no trouble getting money uh, as long as I, I, uh, I uh, have a vision on what I would like to, to, uh, to achieve, and I can articul articulate it. So, uh, so I think that, that's in some sense, I think that it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the sweet spot. I think that this kind of opportunity only happens once in a lifetime. I think that in, 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 in 10 years, this window is going to disappear. China will be regulated, uh, will be much more formal. And, 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 but at this time, I think that if you, are, if you have a vision on what you want to do, uh, I think China is the place to go.
Uh, you mentioned in your uh, talk about the difficulty or the attraction that people had in going to industry, the five PhDs who went to industry and the salary differential. By its very nature, this, the discipline that we are in, you are correctly outlined, has two aspects to it, an applied side and the foundational side. Much of what you described, I think, seems to apply very well to the theoretical foundations. What is the strategy or the line of thinking you have in moving this strategy to be relevant to the more applied side of what we call systems research? Uh, because that would have to be synergistically addressed at some point uh, within the institute and perhaps at the level of the nation. Well, I think that the, uh, uh, the development of the system side, uh, I think that it's really, I, I am interested in applying theory to practice, but uh, I think only at a more uh, conceptual level. I think that, that we are, uh, I think that we are not large enough to be able to think about the uh, uh, all the implementations, uh, but we are certainly interested in things like, like how do you apply the uh, hashing and uh, the other algorithmic techniques to internet, for example. I think we are interested in this kind of, of, of conceptual work. And uh, so we don't really have any plan to become a much, much larger center that encompasses everything in computer science. Uh, but I think that that uh, that uh, there are some some industrial labs, for example, the Microsoft research in China. Uh, I think that they they just just within uh, their establishment, uh, of, uh, I think within five to seven years, they have become one of the one of the great uh, research center in system research in the world. So I think that in China, uh, it will be much easier to do system good system research. So I think that other people would do it. Professor Yao, thank you very much for this very comprehensive uh, report. You touched on something that uh, perhaps as educators uh, um, I'm very interested in and I would like to uh, tap into your wisdom to see how you think about this. Just like yourself, uh, you did not start as a computer theoretical computer scientist. You move around and uh, went from theoretical physics to uh, computer science. So education is a multidimensional thing, whereas in the way you are proposing here is to train students very early on in this very, in some sense, narrow area of theor theoretical computer science but to be a great theoretical computer scientist later on in life, you would need a much broader education. How, how do you see that folded into your part of the uh, effort? Yeah, Da Xuan, uh, I think this is a very good question, and I sometimes ask myself that question. But my answer is that that, uh, that really is a job for the university. This is not a job for me because I, I really I cannot I don't have the resource and the, the authority to uh, design curriculums uh, that would that would take that into account so I have to rely on the existing university wisdom on uh, giving the students enough freedom so that they, they can acquire a broad view of uh, science and humanity as a whole what I uh, uh, what I can do is just to tell the students that you should have a broad view of the world and you should use your judgment on how to get that. Uh, for me, I would just try to teach you how to become a brilliant theoretical computer scientist if you want to. <laughs> Two more short questions. Uh, one back and then here, please. The mic is coming, yeah. Thank you. In the U.S., one of the problems we're facing is to carry out large team science projects. 
I guess particle physics teams are used to that. But for biomedical researchers, uh, that's still a new thing. And what we have experienced in the last 10 years is no matter how much we promote that, the reality is that these teams fall apart, primarily because of how people are credited. Uh, typically in a large team setting, the senior investigators get all the credit and glory, uh, both from in terms of being the principal investigator of grants as well as publications and senior authors. So the reality is that the junior investigators become disillusioned and decide to drop out of the team in order to protect their own interests when it comes to promotion. So I don't know if Tsinghua or any other institution in China is doing anything more creative and innovative in promoting as well as preserving uh, these large productive teams in order to carry out the projects that really re require a, a team collaboration. So I'd like to hear your comments on that. Yeah, I think, I think it, it is a difficult question. And my, my impression is that uh, in that regard, uh, firstly, uh, China doesn't have as much problem as uh, of the sort that you say, because I think in China, the, the obedience to authority is much more ingrained. And so therefore, there will not be uh, really disputes of that kind coming to surface. Because, uh, I do not know whether, whether deep down or whether, whether in the private circles that uh, they have such disputes. But certainly, in, uh, overtly uh, in, in public, you don't really see such things coming to, the, to, to, be, to be controversial. And uh, uh, now, uh, I think that, that, that in a, in a uh, I think that the general question of how credits are distributed, I think that certainly uh, is a problem in China as, as well as uh, elsewhere. For example, when you uh, hear about, uh, you know that China is a, price, is a price country in the sense that there are many, many prices and it's very important to get prices. And now how to, uh, how to, how to give award to, especially in experimental sciences when they are uh, competing groups, they are, they are all having a claim on, on some important uh, discoveries and uh, that I have heard about problems, the difficulties involved. Uh, uh, so those questions do exist. And I imagine that as time goes on, these questions will become more acute. simple question. That is, when I listen to you, it, rem it reminds me of the early development of science and technology in Taiwan. But you did mention, you know, this window of opportunity may only last for 10, 15 years. My question to you is, what are you going to do after 10 or 15 years? Not necessarily you, but China <laughs> in general. <laughs> well, I would hope in 10 to 15 years, the great momentum that China has now will have propelled China to a stage where it is actually prudent to have a more conservative system of deciding the distribution of funding and the, the uh, so everything would be more regulated at that time. Uh, I think that, that uh, if everything goes well, that uh, everything will be perfect because that would be the right thing to do at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate these uh, two wonderful presentations that gave us, have given us a uh, uh, different and, and I think uniquely different perspectives, very important to our workshop. Uh, this will be the end of our uh, of our open session. For those of you who came to hear the presentations this morning, we thank you very much for coming. I want to tell you that the presentations, I think, will be up on, the, on our website uh, soon. And uh, also the workshop which follows, which uh, is, uh, is, is a small workshop to work through some of these issues, will be summarized. We will write a Baker Institute report 
based on our dis deliberations that will take place over the rest of the today and tomorrow. And of course, those reports uh, will be available uh, as well over the website or, or in hard copy. So once again, uh, thank you very much. And please join me in thanking all of our speakers for a wonderful morning.